some stats, 25% of American kids don't have a father. That's a classic causal conundrum because there's so many other factors. When you don't have a father in your home, you know, you can look to that and say, well, this is the reason the kids are doing X, Y, and Z. Rosalind Wiseman, who is a parenting expert as well as a best-selling author, her book, Queen Bees and Wannabes, was the inspiration for the movie Mean Girls. Uh, Rosalind is a teacher. She is a thought leader. She's also a New York Times bestseller author. Wiseman is the co-founder and president of the Power program, through which she teaches girls and boys to recognize the ways they are socialized into hostile, abusive, and violent behaviors. New technology adopt modern, like what is actually going to affect people's lives now. And for example, with ChatGBT, you know, if teachers are saying you can't use it because that's plagiarizing, they don't understand ChatGBT, and it means that they're not doing the work to actually learn about it themselves. Go on Snapchat, they see, you know, someone else talking about them, gossiping, they feel really hurt. I mean, how do they deal with the gossip? I think the thing that happens in these situations is that people get gaslighted a lot. So, you know, you go up to your friend, you're like, okay, you're talking about me. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? No, that didn't happen. I, whenever I think about teenagers, I think about just the many different things that they have to navigate in this modern world, right? So, you know, personally for you, I mean, you have a really strong pulse with teenagers. How do you think they're doing right now? Well, I think they're all over the place. Um, <laughs> I think that um, that they have, you know, there's, I, I don't think that it's all this like doom and gloom or that they are entitled or lazy or, you know, a hundred percent addicted to their, um, so, to social media or that they're superficial. Um, you know, I really, you know, of the things that I just talked about or the issues of mental health that, you know, is, is a, that is like so prevalent in the media right now without taking away the importance of all of those things and the reality of those things, I think that young people's lives are complicated and that within the moments and real struggles, the real moments of struggles, there's actually, you know, they have wonderful, they're doing amazing things um, actually, right? There's huge amounts of creativity and huge amounts of wanting to contribute to make the world a better place and to make a difference in their own lives and in the people's lives around them. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's mixed. I think that we tend to pigeonhole young people um, and it's not good for them and it's not good for us. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the media likes to um, stir up drama, you know, to get eyeballs. And so, you know, what better way than to talk about the challenges teenagers are facing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think to the exclusion, right? I mean, I think that, you know, I think that, yes, it's clickbait to talk about how, you know, much young people are committing suicide or mm -hmm. mental health issues or addiction to social media or addiction to lots of different things. Um, but I really do think that, you know, we, they are, that young people are constantly doing a tremendous amount of things for the good. And we just don't talk about that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we, yeah, you're right. We like to, it's, it's like, we can't have one without the other. We have to just assume that everything's terrible. Right. As if, like we can't just incorporate and hold two thoughts at one time, which is that things actually that at the same time as things can be really complicated and difficult, mm -hmm. um, sometimes scary. And they are also doing some amazing things. Right. Absolutely. So I know you wrote two books, you know, um, one for teenage boys, one for teenage girls, helping them kind of overcome challenges specific to each, you know, um, uh, gender. So for males, um, what unique challenges do they face, you know, and maybe even related to the modern age? Yeah, well, so, you know, this gets us into the whole thing, like immediately of gender and how people are talking about gender. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really important as somebody who's written about this and thought about it a lot and walked beside young people as these issues have changed um, and the way in which young people think about them have changed. Um, I think what's also really important, even before you get into topics of like, how are boys dealing or how are girls dealing or what does that mean or anything like that, is that I think overall the most important thing to think about is that usually what, what young people want and need and are advocating and pushing for are exactly those things that make adults uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And when adults get uncomfortable, because especially adults who have power, who have authority, 
is that the way in which they push back is to usually dominate, suppress, mock, um, and in some ways just sort of stifle the needs that young people are saying that they that they want. And so it gets complicated because it becomes an issue not of young people's development, but of adults and their exercise and flexing of power over young people. Mm-hmm. And so I so this issue of gender is is really important and it's really complicated. It's always been complicated. Um, so the, here's a really good example of everybody's truth there is true, right? Like they all have these, you know, their own experiences. So there are a lot of boys out there who are st- who are in a more traditional or what we would call more traditional kind of way in which they're growing up and that they still feel like they can't express their emotions except for being angry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being like that is like the permitted emotion that they can express or else that everything is fine, mm-hmm. right? It's fine, it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, and they're still living in that world. And there are also a lot of boys who look at that and are like, I don't want that. That's I don't want that. I deserve a lot more emotions than that. And there are a lot of boys who are feeling like they're not sure if they are boys or not, or what that means to them and how they want to identify that way. So there's just this huge spectrum. And I think what's most important is that everyone's experience is true. And the thing that I think is really important that I tell and talk to and discuss with young people a lot is it's natural to want to be, to, you're going through development, right? Whoever you are, however you identify, you're going through development You're as when you're a teenager. And if you can figure out like what is really containing you or restraining you or boxing you in and figuring out what the cost is about that, then that's really important. And um, and so if you're a boy and you're feeling like I can't express my feelings the way that I'd like to, or it's stopping me from being able to have the friendships that I want, um, then that's what's really important. And that's what's really important to honor um, in the lives of young, of boys, because boys have deep emotional lives. Mm-hmm. Right. So earlier you mentioned, you know, sometimes um, teenagers, teenage boys will do things uh, or want their parents to just kind of help them with something that might be touchy. And then, you know, the parent would exert their power. Right. And mm. so what are some examples of that? You know, can you elaborate on that? Oh, well, when I was talking about adults, I was talking about all different kinds of people from yeah. parents to teachers, to coaches, to politicians who are using you know, a lot of politicians on all different sides of the political aisle are using young people's adolescent development for their own political gain. And mm-hmm. I mean that on both sides. And it's it's really, um, for somebody who's worked with young people as long as I have, you know, it's just amazing. I never, I never, I never, it's like, wow, here are adults again, co-opting and um, co-opting young people's development for their own political gain and um, and losing their common sense in the process and losing their responsibilities to young people in the process. So, and again, I mean this across the political aisle. I'm not just talking about really conservative people. I'm also talking about what's so-called really liberal people too. So, um, so what I believe is, is that young people must be treated with dignity, that they must must be acknowledged, their experiences must be acknowledged, and that they must be seen as the subject matter experts of their lives. And because I am an expert in young people, but I have no idea what it's like to actually be a young person today. So I have wisdom. I'm an adult. I have things to share, but it only makes sense if I listen to the context in which young people are growing up. So in answer to your question, we adults, as you know, we tend to lecture boys um, and tell them what they need to do and get really angry at them easily. And instead of being able to create an environment where we are saying to boys at first, like, hey, you know, I'm your parent, I'm your teacher, I'm your coach. Um, I need to understand the what you know the the world you're living in, the life you're living in, before I give you, <clears throat> excuse me, advice or tell or give you commandments about what you have to do, um, because boys are really really good at hiding the complexity of their lives, like the the political dynamics and the power dynamics that are going on in their friendships, or, for example, on an athletic team, or the experiences of power dynamics they're having with adults in their lives. They're really good at shutting their experiences down and saying. 
it's okay. I've got this because there's this thing that we still have that boys are supposed to be able to handle everything on their own. And, and if they don't handle things on their own, then somehow they're emasculated or somehow they're less mature. Or somehow they're not like the men that they should be. And what is so pathetically sad about that is that we know, I mean, it makes common sense, but we know and the boys know, like if you ask boys, like, who are your boys? Who are your people in your group chat? Like, those are your boys. They know that going through life together is better. And yet we still have this thing and boys still have this thing in their head of got to do this on my own. I got to handle this on my own. If not, there's something wrong with me. And um, the more that we, affirm, the more that we don't address that, the more that we don't listen to boys about the situations that they're in and sort of dig deeper then we're never going to be able to help them. And we're never really going to be credible to them either. Mm, I see. So problem, a uh, big problem is that, you know, there's a perception out there that as a boy, you have to figure it out on your own. That's what kind of like men, you know, quote unquote men do. And so you need to figure out yourself. And so that is doing them a disservice because you know, not everything can be solved on your own. It's sometimes it's better to, you know, work with other people to solve a problem. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, I just actually was reading research about boys who um, are studying math, like um, calculus, calculus on their own in comparison to people who study in groups. And people who study on their own tend to not do as well as people who study in groups. And the thing that actually I think is even more important than that is that besides like the grade you get in your calculus test is that when you study alone and you don't do well, you get the bad grade. You think there is something intrinsically wrong with you about the, the fact that you got this bad mm -hmm. grade. Mm -hmm. If you are studying with a group of people, you tend to have a more realistic assessment of what did we not get as a group or what did we need to do better as a group? It's not all on your shoulders. You don't feel you're less likely to feel like this shame of like, it's all on me. Mm -hmm. and, so the more, and so if you just take that, that's a math class. If you take that to like mental health or anxiety or depression or anger and you, and you parallel that to like boys saying, no, I got to handle this on my own instead of being able to, instead of knowing that they, if, that the more they reach out to other trusted people, who are there helping them on the along the way, that it's going to be way, way better. It doesn't feel like it's all on them and all on their shoulders to go through and to be able to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can agree with that because, you know, in business, we kind of call that a mastermind, you know, where business people kind of come together and put their heads together and they share ideas with each other. Now, at the other uh, on the other side but of the can token. Can I ask you a question about that though? Yeah, sure. About masterminds? Because I, I mean, tell me what you think. I'll tell you what I think about that. You tell me what you think. I think the culture of masterminds while talking about that kind of stuff, so not sometimes like that. I think it's sometimes, mm -hmm. it's sometimes, what's the word, sort of um, favors men who, especially men who have like have this aura about them of being able to do this stuff or entrepreneurs who made mm -hmm. all this money. And that they did it on their own and they're coming to the, the math, this mastermind class or group to be with their peers who similarly did that. And that they, because they're so cool and smart and awesome, that they are working, that they together are working, to, right? Because they're smart enough to do it with each other. So I sort of call a little BS on master on masterminds kind of programs, because I think sometimes it really does reinforce masculine stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a bad actors, you know, that kind of prey on people's insecurities or people's lack of success. And then they kind of sh make themselves seem like a guru and they have all the answers. Oh, yes. At yes. the end of the day, they're just trying to sell, you know, <laughs> you know make another buck. And so there's, it, there is a lot of that. For my 400th on. webinar, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. There, there is a lot of that going on. No question. <laughs> But right. I think and that you, you know, these... emails from them to sign up for their 400. Right. Like, Dude, seriously, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I yeah. just think there's like this cult of personality around masterminds that we've got to be. You know, I wrote a book called Masterminds that mm -hmm. like <laughs> that like they, you know, there's like this cult of personality around all these like exited entrepreneurs who are like these cool guys who like do all this stuff. I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's <laughs> definitely been quote unquote gurus that have given it a bad name, and mm -hmm. so um, I think that 
the core of like the truest form of mastermind, where it's actually people that are like-minded coming together to share ideas yeah. so that will benefit each other. I think in the truest form, it could be a great way to accelerate, you know, their business. And Absolutely. so, um, and, but at the end of the day, like on the other token, you know, you can only share so many ideas at the end yeah. of the day, you have to go out there and implement those ideas to help grow your business. Right. And so at what point do people like, is it good to say for boys that, okay, we've, we've kind of worked together on this. There are some problems that you needed to go solve on your own. So how do they, how do you like classify which problems should be solved together as, in a group mm. versus, you know, doing it on, on your own? Yeah. So I really think of it as, as not either, or I think of it as, and so, yeah. So I mean, I'm a, I'll talk about boys. Cause you're asking me about boys. I happen to think that everyone needs these kinds of things that, um, that, so boys need a, um, a real understanding of what emotions are, what feelings are, what moods are, and how whatever society and culture they've grown up in has taught them about what emotion, what feelings, right? Because emotions are physiological um, in your, you know, experiences. They are physical experiences in your body. And your feelings are a result of emotions and moods are a string of feelings. So basically that it's like one, two, and three. And emotions, it's really important to remember that emotions are real. They are absolutely real. If you feel them, they're real. And that you don't have to be stuck in, a, in a one emotion or where you are in an emotional state forever. And I think that for boys, because they're not often allowed to express the full panoply, the full spectrum of emotions, that emotions can be really scary, especially mm -hmm. if the emotions that you think you're most likely, that you're most easily permitted to show, or the one that you've seen most likely from other men in your life, that if that's anger, then, then emotions are frightening. They, I mean, understandably, they are frightening and they are overwhelming. And when you feel those, that feeling of anger, or you, or you, it gets all mushed up into one big ball of anxiety, basically, that it can really feel like too much. And then you shut down mm. or you explode. And so to say to boys, you know, your emotions are real. They are powerful. You process every single thing that you do emotionally first and then intellectually no matter how mm -hmm. like intellectually focused you are you pro the first thing that happens is you have an emotional reaction and then your prefrontal cortex processes that those processes those emotions and thoughts come from those emotions so it's so these are this is a this is a process and so emotions are real you don't have to be stuck in the emotion that you're in at this moment you can move through them to a better place and the more that you are, you're skilled and intelligent about emotions, the more your anxiety is going to go down and the more control and mastery you're going to have over your emotional life and how you present to other people and how, and, and also how you will increase your emotional intelligence and your anxiety um, will usually go down because you have a way of identifying and describing how you're feeling. And the more you can, the more you know what's happening to you, the more you can describe it to yourself, the more you can describe it to other people. So um, that is a, just a life skill that is mm -hmm. absolutely essential for everybody to have. And, um, more important than the grades you get, more important than the college you get into, more important than how much money you make, it is, are you going to go through life with some kind of self-agency, some kind of mastery of self? And as a result, are you going to be around people that are going to be able to support you and truly have your back? And that you have like intimate relationships, friend relationships that you truly can depend on. Like, you know, like you can depend on that. Mm -hmm. So, and that they reflect well on you also. That's the other part is like that you have friends that you're like, yeah, like that person, you know, I want to be associated with that person, not for superficial reasons, the car they drive, the shoes they're wearing, what their Instagram, whatever. It's like that they show up in the world in a way they're like, yeah, that's, that's my person. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we learn, when boys learn that, that's really like when you, when you start with that, then you can get to how do I interact with other people? And when you're feeling, as we all do, overwhelmed by or need help to process the experiences you have, 
you've got the people around you that can help you and reflect back to you and, and support you into understanding what's happening in your life more effectively. So it's not one or the other, it's mm. and. And it's such a shame that not only do boys often not learn how important emotions are and they and they actually think that they should denigrate them because it, you know, it's emasculating, but mm. that um, asking for help is weak instead of mm. a, really a sign of capacity and skill and strength. Right. It sounds a lot like stoicism, you know, like Absolutely. It, you, it's, it's not that like your thoughts and your feelings aren't real. You do have them, but then you kind of keep them in check. Like you, you control them, but you can only control them once you identify it and you're self-aware enough to understand what it is. And so oh. that way you don't go through life too high or too low. You're always at this steady sort of, oh. Um, I don't know if I agree with that because I mean I think that if you really, I could be totally wrong with stoicism. Well, yeah, well, let's, I mean we should talk about it. I mean, like stoicism to me is like not being allowed to, and I mean this is where you know this is where it gets interesting. Is for me the connotation of stoicism is that you are not expressing your emotions when you you know that you're controlling your emotions to the extent that you're sort of suppressing them, and then mm -hmm. so you're stoic as a result. Um, I think that when you go through this, I want boys and men to have, have really be able to come into their emotional lives, like to really have the relationships with their friends and their intimates and their family in a way that, that they deserve. And, and that includes, by the way, that when they've had really messed up, screwed up relationships with people that they get to say, yeah, I actually deserve better. I deserve better. And that includes the women that they're in relationships with. That includes the people in their families, their siblings. Like, you know, if you have an older sibling who dominates you, for example, or somebody who gaslights you a lot, that you have the right to say like, no, I actually, I deserve better in my relationships because my relationships are important to me. They support mm -hmm. me. You know, I deserve to have the people in my life around me that I want to have. And I, sometimes I think that boys, we don't tell that. We tell that to girls mm -hmm. some. Right. We tell that more to girls, but I don't think we talk to boys about that as much as we should. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's fair to say that like a lot of, you know, like you mentioned, boys aren't learning this right to identify their feelings that they're real, identify their thoughts. It's real how to control it. I think that's why there's so many, you know, if you think of like mass shootings, for example, like the wow. extreme version of violence. Right. Mm -hmm. They haven't learned how to cope with you know, understand their emotions and feelings. And so they kind of rage. They don't have their um, emotions yeah. checked. So that way they just are just violent to others. Do you think that has to do with it? I think that there, that the system that we, I think, you know, it's, it's so people are, how do I even begin? Right. I mean, I usually um, have like, you know, like what's the answer to that question. And um I think that there's a whole system that boys are growing up in that says like, if you are upset and disenfranchised, if you feel like you are alienated from a group that you, that, you know, your community, that um, I, th let me, there's so many things I think about this, that it's, um, it's like, where to even begin? So like, I think, you know, of course, there is tremendous amounts of mental health needs for of young people that are not being met. There, I mean, so we'll just go down like the list that there are there, we don't have the kind of community structures to hold boys and give them rites of passage where they feel that they've um that they are earning prestige. That and this is what I mean by earned prestige. And it's a, this is a project I'm working on with this incredible colleague of mine, David Yeager, right now. Um, that Boy, I mean, again, we're talking about boys, but everybody has this, that everybody needs, boys need a way to feel that they belong in the group because they have something of value that makes the group respect their actions, respect the fact that they are in this group because of not just who they essentially are, because everybody gets that. Everybody should have like, you get to be treated with dignity just because you are. But earn prestige is something, you know, boys are constantly seeking how to feel that they belong in the group because they're giving something and contributing to the group. They're valued. And so you have, you know, so you have a mental health, you have mental health issues that we do not address uh, um, effectively. I mean, I know that because I work with young people that when you have a young person in crisis with mental health, getting them help right away is 
extraordinarily difficult, mm -hmm. right? Like three, there are no, there, I mean, the fact that there are three month waiting periods for acute pr problems, mental health problems for a child is a crime, literally is a crime, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's right. And then we don't have community places where boys can feel a sense or often feel a sense of I belong and I'm contributing. And you have a whole world of our culture that really sees the investment in and a wanting to buy into this image of boys being controlling, aggressive, um, disrespectful to women dominating, you know, winners take it all, um, relationships don't really matter, you know, reciprocal relationships are effeminate, um, that, I mean, all of these things is kind of really, and I don't use the word lightly of toxic, you know, like I have 10 year olds who talk about toxic masculinity that I work with, but it really, it's not toxic masculinity to me is it's toxic to the person that it's poisoning to the boy, to the young man who has the right to have meaningful relationships with other people. And, um, and there are people who just, who want boys to be dominating, bullying, you know, winner take all mm. and denigrating other people. And when we do that, we are literally creating a culture that glorifies violence and demeaning of people who have less power than you do. And then, of course, we have extraordinary access to the weapons, literally, that can weaponize all of these attributes. So when you have all of these things together, it's, you know, some of the contribution of why there have been so many young men who have gone into schools and have murdered people. And so many young men who look at those boys who have done that and want to emulate them and think that they somehow are um, in a position of power. Mm. Yeah, I think that is a fair assessment. Um, there's so many, you know, this topic is so complicated and there's so many problems to point to that need to be solved. Um, yeah. One of them, I'm kind of curious to hear what you think, but you know, I've seen stats that said, uh, I think it was around like a quarter, 25% of American kids don't have a father, you know? And so and then I see some other stats of like, okay, them, uh, kids who were not born in families uh, with a father commit more crime or more likely to rape, or, you know, they're like, you see all these statistics. Um, how do you think that's affecting teenagers mm -hmm. you know, in general, not having yeah, that? Well, that so model. that's like, it's a that's a classic causal, conundrum because there's so many other factors when you don't have a father in your home um you know you can look to that and say well this is the reason the kids are doing x y and z but at the same time i, I mean i really look to um what are the systems of support that the child doesn't have um because or what and what is the system of support that the father and the mother did not have what are systemic reasons that the family, for example, you know, you know, not having a father, um, you know, when we say statistics like children who do not grow up um, with a father totally can gloss over the fact that so many men have been incarcerated and so many black and brown men have been incarcerated unfairly because of systemic racism have been put into our incarceration system. And therefore, continue a generation of children who do not have fathers the way that those men did not have fathers. And so I really, when we talk about things like, you know, children who grow up without fathers, we have to look at the systemic things in our society that deny fathers being in, in their own families. We have to look at an educational system that has systematically, systematically denied educations, good educations, especially to black and brown people and to people who have less money, less financial resources. The educational system in our country, and I've been in education for 25 years, I've dedicated my life, which is really ironic to me sometimes and incredibly frustrating, that the educational system is built on inequity. It was supposed, it is supposed to be the foundation of our democracy, but it is literally built on inequity and denying young people, especially young people with less resources and who are marginalized to actually have an education that gives them a way to think and to be able to look into their future and say, I can contribute to society. 
and that the society wants me. You only have to look at the schools, most schools around this country who literally, that are literally built like jails for us to think that like, that the fact that there that there's a lot of young people that are raised without fathers is only is only like the the easy billboard that we look at and underneath it is just this quagmire of a mess of inequality and of really like strategically on purpose done to uh, deny people some people in our country education the right to have housing that makes stable housing the right to healthcare, all of these things absolutely contribute to the fact that a young man, for example, who has children is not in his own home. Mm, I see. So you think that there's systems that are preventing, you know, there's not enough support systems in order for children that were born in a single family home to succeed. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the problems I think it's easy to blame individual people for individual mm -hmm. failings. I am all about people taking responsibility for their behavior and their lives. And yet, at a certain point, we have to recognize that the system in which they are operating is doing everything they can, everything mm -hmm. it can to not make that person succeed. And so how can we expect, I mean, and really there's like this, there's a rub here, right? Of like, people need to take responsibility for their behavior. Right. And when you uh, when you make it so difficult so i mean just you know honestly it's just so you know it gets me like it gets it's hard because mm -hmm. educational systems really in this country are about compliance and uh, compliance and about obedience regardless sometimes of how the adults or the system is actually treating young people and so you know a young, for example a young man learns that he can't trust the educational system because teachers will bully you, coach, coaches will bully you. The system is not, for example, if you get behind, if your parent gets behind on processing the processing the money or la, or the, the the paperwork that you need to get to be able to be eligible to get lunch at school, mm -hmm. right? Lunch at school, and then you go to school. And there are a lot of schools that still do not put children first, do not put children's dignity first. And if you are behind on your on your lunch card or your mom and your single mom who is working really hard and um, doesn't have, there's no dad at home and she, she fell behind on the paperwork for lunch, which could be really difficult to fill out. And you get to the lunch line and the person says behind the, you know, at the lunch counter is like, sorry, you can't have your net, you're behind on your lunch account. I can't give it to you. You got to go get that the paper bag lunch right down, you know, right down there, which signifies to all the other children that you are poor or that you and that you're, you know, that you this is what you deserve. You don't deserve to even stand in lunch and get regular lunch. You got to go get the brown paper bag lunch. So that child, just from that one experience, is like, is school a place that I can trust? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Am I learning education? No, I'm not. Are they denigrating and taking away my dignity? Absolutely. Over a really sm seemingly small thing as lunch? Yeah, absolutely. Do I want to be here? No. Do I trust authority figures? No. And at school, now that we have SROs, school resource officers all over the place, and although some of them are really good, and I work with SROs all the time, very few of them, very few of them have been trained in adolescent development, and they are control and compliance. Mm -hmm and just want to get something safe, like they want safety and regardless of what is happening in the moment. And so, you know, you have children or young men who are growing up in these school systems that are like, why would I ever trust this? And then they go walk down the street and they're dealing with, with law enforcement. Why would they trust that? And at the, so the whole system, they try and rent something. They don't have good credit. Why don't they have good credit? Because they couldn't, they didn't learn in school in their math class about something they actually could use about how to apply for a credit card. It's just... Mm. It is, it is, it is not enough to just look at and say, there are no men in these homes. And that mm. is why children are more, are more likely to commit a crime. Mm, I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think you know, there's so many different problems that we need to tackle. And it's not like a one sort of issue, right, of why, you know, uh, young people struggle and, you know, partially like you talked about is the school system and how it needs to be reformed, I think, um, to be more modern, especially with AI coming, you know, um, you know, school is banning chat GPT isn't going to work. You know, I think no, that's it's not. That's so stupid. Yeah, no, I think schools right. need to like, you know, adopt 
new technology adopt the modern like what is actually going to affect people's lives now versus um being in a system that has been just pretty much the same for decades right i mean and you know honestly again i have spent my life in education and i'm really dedicated to it and for example, with ChatGPT, you know, if teachers are saying you can't use it because that's plagiarizing. They don't understand ChatGPT, and it means that they're not doing the work to actually learn about it themselves, and um, and they're scared of it. And so they can sit and get and try and you know be try and discipline or more to the point punish kids who use it, and or they could actually see it as well. This is something that's a tool, and. It's not a, it's not this like, you know, there's lots of complexities to that tool. And so I'm going to actually take the initiative and learn about it. What, what some teachers don't like is that it gives, um, it may, gives the feeling that they're losing control and authority mm -hmm. over young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. So I want to talk about your two books. You know, I know we're talking a lot about um, males and boys um, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll do that for a little bit because I know you wrote book for boys and then one for girls so we'll, we'll touch on both but um you know for boys specifically you know one of your books schoolyard uh, power locker room tests um dealing with douchebags <laughs> so um let's break down those three so related to boys I mean uh, what is schoolyard power and like how is that affecting them and how can they overcome it well I mean I, I really feel like um that, when I wrote that, when I wrote that title, it was about that boys are, you know, people will tend to say like, girls are so complicated, boys are simple. Mm -hmm. And I um, think that a lot of people are complicated. People have complicated lives and um, boys are dealing with very complicated power dynamics that they, that I think lots of times that boys understand the group dynamics and they just think there's nothing they can do about it. And they just have to mm -hmm. deal with it. So um, girls tend to get sort you know, more, it's more complicated in some ways or the way it feels because there's more bumping up against like, wait, why is she being like that? And she can't be this way and she's being evil and she's being a queen bee or, you know, like that kind of stuff. Boys in my experience, and, you know, so I can be wrong, obviously in my experience with boys is that they sort of see the lay of the land. They see which boy has power, which has social power and um and which doesn't and why and they're like okay that's the lay of the land i get it and i'm never I, there's nothing i can do about it so mm -hmm. i'm just going i'm gonna live with what i've been given and um the thing that um i wanted boys and the reason that i wrote about that is i wanted boys to be able to recognize when they were in situations where they could say actually this is not okay and that they could do something about it that they could feel empowered to not only identify that it's whatever it was wasn't okay and that there was something they could do about it. Mm. I see. So um, how do you empower them to do something about it? If that's how, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, and I'm sorry, my, I don't know why my, I'm being so, um, I, I, why these interruptions are happening. Don't understand why. So excuse me, I've got my, my no interruptions on. Um, so what can they do about it? I mean, first of all, like what I said about all that stuff about emotions is really where it starts is like, mm -hmm. you have the right to the feelings that you have, period. <laughs> like you actually do. And you have a right to really want really deep friendships with people. And that there's nothing wrong with you if you want really deep friendships with people. And, um, and, and then it is, and you have the right when things don't go well in those relationships to be upset about what's going on in those friendships. And that is okay. And it is okay to be depressed and it's okay to be anxious and you don't just have to take it. And um, because sooner or later, if you have that thing of like, you're just, you just have to take it, it's going to come out in some way and it's, you're, and it's not going to go well for anybody, including you. So I think that's the first part. And then the second part is giving the words like, you know, one of the things I do a lot with boys is when they, if they have a lot of, say, for example, this is one of many examples, but say if they've got a um, girl who's really, really mad at them. And so mm -hmm. she's talking and giving like a million different words coming at them and it's totally overwhelming. So instead of shutting down or instead of, you know, just being like, I'm out or saying something that gets her even more angry, like, you know, why are you being so uptight? Why are you being so dramatic? Like those kinds of things, which make girls go from here to there. Um, 
is for you is actually for you to stay present in the conversation and to say, like, I need you to take a pause. You're telling you're giving me so much information. I literally cannot hear what you are saying. Mm. I actually do want to hear what you're saying. So can you choose one thing? To, can you choose one thing that you really want me to understand right now? Not not and just le- just and if she can't do it, then you could say, look, I really do want to hear what you have to say. I do. It's important to me. You're important to me. Whatever, however the kid's going to say it. And be able to say, you know, when when you, you know, if she can't deal with it, and she just keeps on going to be able to say, I actually need to take a pause. Like, I do want to talk to you. Can't do it right now because you're too upset. You're too, you're not mm-hmm. listening to what I'm asking you to do. So I can't listen to you. So can we talk in two hours? And don't, and and in the meantime, do not text me like 400 times, Mm -hmm. like really long texts. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. This is why, by the way, (laughs) I have to say, as an enormous, enormous fan of South Park for many, 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 many years, I honestly think the chat GBT episode was one of the funniest, most prescient, best episodes of South Park I've ever seen. I've because seen, basically that's seen. what it that's what they were doing was using uh, chat gbt right to like <laughs> put up a wall of like overwhelming amounts of words that were coming at them from their girlfriends it was genius oh, genius man. that's awesome i love it so it seems like you know from what i'm hearing it's advocating for yourself it's speaking up um but in a very respectful and empathetic way um and cordial way. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I, I could see how that would help. Definitely. And putting um, up boundaries, right? Mm-hmm. Like right. you get to put up boundaries. You know, if you've got somebody screaming at you or you've got somebody who's like, you know, here's the thing that I think is really tough about this generation because I mentor a lot of people in their late teens and twenties. I employ a lot of people in their teens and twenties. Mm-hmm. And one of the challenges I have in my role um, is that as their supervisor is that when there's a conflict that happens, what I've noticed um, in my interactions with the people that I work with is that there's this incredible need to get a response back immediately. So if they're mm-hmm. upset with something that's happening with work with me, they need my assurance right away and they need a resolution right away. I mean, I'm talking like second. Mm-hmm. And th- first of all, that's not realistic, right? Mm-hmm. In a working, re- it, first of all, it's not realistic in a work really work situation because the other person has things to do. But in a personal interaction, like personal relationship, it's not helpful either because right. you don't give the other person a moment to think about what they're going to do or what they want to do, what they think or what they feel. And so what you're going to get is their most reactive, most um, non-helpful response. Mm. In the, in the un, like in the demand to get the response, you are going to get the worst response possible right? because they're just going to be like, I got to get out of this. Right. Or they're going to, or they're going to, they're going to go to chat GPT and say, like, you know, like what South Park did, right? Like, right. what do I do? And then start, and then chat GPT actually gives you a pretty good response. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. I remember, um, you know, I used to work with college students as well, you know, uh, 18, 19, 20. And one thing I found was very similar to you. There were some that just kind of wanted uh, a response from me really quickly. And so what I learned is, okay, first I got to set boundaries of how long it'll take me to respond, you know, like, and and we would agree to that. But second is also empowering them to solve their own problems, you know? And so like an exercise I did with them was, okay, you know, what are three ways you think you can solve this problem? And they would share those three ways. It's like, okay, based on that, what, do you think the best way for you to solve that would be? And then, you know, they give it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's how I would solve it. And so next time they wouldn't be so demanding, you know, like, oh, I, I need you to help right now. Eventually got to the point where they would, were able to solve their own problems without me to, you know, yeah. or wanting my approval, you know? Right, right, absolutely. And I also think that in those situations, because there's a demand for a response, it ratchets things up so fast right. that you that you say something. I just had a person in their 20s who just imploded on me mm-hmm. uh, because of not being able to manage their anxiety. And, you know, really, 
wrote things that I just couldn't, it was like, okay, well, you know, I need to set a hard boundary. Like I, I, I didn't let the person go because wow. of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fortune. So, um, let's continue on. So douchebags. <laughs> so how can, um, Here's that book. Uh-huh. <laughs> how can boys, you know, uh, manage douchebags? <laughs> well, first of all, when that book, um, so I wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes, right? And then I wrote the boys version of it for adults. But then I thought, well, there's no way girls read Queen Bees and Wannabes a lot, but there's no way that guys are going to read a self-help book for parents, you know, or educators mm-hmm. about that. There's no way. So um, I wrote a companion that was just for the boys themselves. And that's the book you're referring to. And just so we're clear, I don't write any of these books without young people actually helping me write them. Mm. So for that, for both boys books, I had about 150 boys on a regular basis for a year, help me to create mm. both of those books. And um, one of the most important things they would say is they would read the advice that I was giving and say like, that is awful advice. Like if somebody adult tells me that I am never listening to that. Right. Like, absolutely not. In fact, actually I did it yesterday um, when I, with a group of editors where I was like, I again was, I said, you know, is this advice good? And they're like, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, am I ever going to get this right? So, <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that there's this, um, toleration of there's so many things I think about this first is I think that there's a lot of wisdom that some boys have and some young men and men have about tolerating a guy who is flexing this kind of toxic masculinity this kind of dominating kind of you know regressive super not helpful super I'm not even using the word toxic masculinity because people make fun of me about it Um, I'll be much more clear about what I mean, like obnoxious, dominating, arrogant. Why would you ever want to be around that person Mm -hmm. kind of guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's just call it for what it is where you're like, oh my God, I cannot wait to get away from this guy. And, um, and you would never trust this guy. Like, by the way, you can't trust this guy because he's always going to be focused on his making sure that he looks like he has the most amount of power in the room. I mean, that's, that's what you can trust. You can't trust his character. You trust like what is going to give him the most amount of satisfaction for his ego. That is what the Mm -hmm. only thing you can trust. So I think that there's a lot of, lot of young men who have a lot of experience and wisdom about how to tolerate this person in your, um, in your social group or in your world. I know this person also can like drink or, you know, especially drinking, not smoking pot or other drugs, but like, especially drinking, like, you you know, he drinks and he gets mean. Mm -hmm. And then um, like, maybe he's arrogant and annoying when he's sober, but he's mean when he's drunk. And then the next day he comes back and he's like, oh dude, I'm so sorry. Right. I was so drunk and like blames the alcohol. So lame. And, um, and then the guy's like, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you forget about it until the next time the guy gets drunk and then you're back in the same place. So, um, and if you're a friend of that guy, you can often feel like you're babysitting him, which you basically mm-hmm. are. Um, so, which is ironic for a guy that needs to prove that he's like, you know, the toughest guy in the room, because basically mm-hmm. he's being babysat by other people. It's like life is so ironic. Right. So I think, you know, how do you manage these guys? Like, first of all, I think you minimize the amount of interaction you have with them. Um, I would not trust them as friends. You know, Mm -hmm. lots of times people have them as like people that they've grown up with. And I think that if you've got that guy in your life, I think you give him the credit because I think that those guys actually want good relationships. They just don't have a clue how is that you sit down with that guy, not like when he's super drunk, not when he's hung over the next morning, not like just when things are calm, when things are relatively calm and it's not a crisis point. And you say something like, in your own words, obviously, you know, like we are really good friends. And I got to tell you, it is intolerable to be around you for the following reasons. Like you're an asshole and here are the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, look, I could pretend this isn't bothering me. I could keep our friendship sort of superficial and drift away, which I've definitely thought about, but out of my loyalty to you, I'm actually going to tell you what I think about it. You obviously could do what you want with it, take it or leave it. But I need to take care of myself and I do not want to be around somebody who's doing this to other people. I I just can't. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a really big problem. I want to be, have this friendship with you. I want, you know, you mean something to me and I don't know where to go. So you want to, you want to talk about this or not? And then, you know, 
you can ask, you see how he responds. He could get really defensive in the beginning because that's like a really hard thing to say. And mm -hmm. ironically, these are really tough guys. And this also includes people like on TV and stuff like you're seeing in the Barbie movie is that they just whine and complain so much. They get so defensive and they get so like, oh, I can't take this. You know, they get like, rah, 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 you know, all this stuff. And um, just let them have their moment because people. it's hard, you know, to be, it's hard, to, it's easy to get defensive. It's hard to get information about yourself that's painful and doesn't make you look great. So give them a moment and be like, look, I know this is hard. Think about it. We'll talk about it later. Walk out the room. And a couple hours later, or, you know, like, have you thought about what I told you? And if he can't handle it, you know what kind of friendship you have, which mm -hmm. is based on loyalty and maybe based on lo like loyalty of years, but you know, you can't trust the friendship. So just, just be honest with yourself about it. Um, and, you know, and then, but I would always say to someone like that door is always open, right? Anytime you want to have like a real conversation, door is always open. And if he starts to emasculate you like, oh my God, I can't believe you need to talk about your feelings or whatever stupid shit like that, excuse my language. Um, you can, you can say, no, actually what, what I want is a real friendship with you, like a real thing. I don't want a superficial relationship with you. So if you are interested in that, let me know. It's totally up to you. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that uh, approach. And, you know, you kind of laid it out like a role play of what people can, you know, do, and they can re-listen to it and just kind of practice it on your own, you know, because sometimes it's kind of touchy you know, when you're in the heat of the moment and, you know, your friendships on the line you know, your emotions kind of get in the way, it gets a little fuzzy, but just practicing it a few times in a, when you're calm, it really helps. I love that. Now let's kind of, um, and by the way, I definitely admire you. You know, one of the things you said was uh, you never just uh, work on a book by yourself and you have oh. other people to test it on. It mm -hmm. kind of reminds me of like, you know, a business because business, sometimes people will create a product and they're like, I think people like this. And they just like create it without yeah. asking their consumers what they think about it. Right. And get feedback to improve it. But you actually went to people instead of just saying, oh, this is the best advice I have and then run with it. You actually, you know, test it out with 150 boys and you were able to tweak that advice to be something that's more beneficial for them so I admire you for that oh thanks you just have to be ready to be okay with being wrong a lot yeah <laughs> you're, like, you're like oh huh mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> actually I'll tell you this a girl said this to me Monday and I thought this was really important um it's this little tiny stuff where I said to this group of teenagers all right tell me what a, a, a parent could say that you if you heard it you'd be like no I don't want to talk to you, right? Like you'd be like, right? And one of this girl said, if a parent comes up to me and says, I need to talk to you, I am immediately out. I don't want to hear mm -hmm. it. And because I know that I'm being accused of something. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, there are so many parents who would come at this of like, I need to talk to you because I'm worried. I need to mm -hmm. talk to you because there was this really important thing that's happening, or whatever. They would never think from the parent's point of view that saying, I need to talk to you would be an immediate thing of like, nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as soon as she said that, I was like, oh my God, she's so right. As soon as you hear, I need to talk to you, all sorts of alarm bells go off. I'm like, oh, you're so smart. That's so true. And it's such a small thing, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, let's kind of, I know we only have not that much time left, but uh, relate for teenage girls. I mean, you, um, in some of your book, uh, your book, you mentioned surviving clicks, gossiping. So um, how do you think social media has really affected that? You know, do you think it really accelerated it to take it to a whole nother level? Well, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing that I know is that the issues are still like the evergreen issues are still there. Like you want to be included in the group. It feels like crap when you're not. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just on that, you'll just take that. And now the fact that you cannot be included, somebody can lie to you, but then you see on Snapchat or wherever, like them having a really good time at the place that they excluded you um, is just so hurtful. It's like, you know, rubbing salt in the wound kind of thing. And so that's just one example of how, how much, you know, how, how it is worse because of social media. Um, so. 
you know, I, there's just so many different ways that it is. And there's also ways, of course, where kids are, you know, doing it in ways that are, you know, wonderful. But the fact that, look, I just came off of for the first time, four days, I went hiking last weekend for four days and did not leave my and left my phone. And so, you know, didn't even use it to take pictures. And um, it was, you know, of course, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Wow. Yeah, that, that seems uh, difficult to do for many people, including myself. <laughs> oh, me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say, you know, they go on Snapchat, they see, you know, someone else talking about them, gossiping, they, they feel really hurt. I mean, how do they deal with the gossip and how do mm. they... Um, work with that. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that happens in these situations is they people get gaslighted a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, you go up to your friend, you're like, okay, you're talking about me. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? No, that didn't happen. You know, <laughs> and you're you're sitting there like, wait, am I wait, hold on one second. And then you can get distracted and go think of the other person who right. told you was the reason. And then you're like, ah, and then your head just goes, right. So um you know, I think that the, I, in those situations, what I tell um, girls to do, I mean, again, <laughs> anybody can have be, you know, people can talk about anybody behind their back is, um, you know, to say like, this is, this is what I think you're taught. This is what I think you're saying about me. This is what I, I think. Is it accurate? And so you leave it to them to be able to say like, yes mm -hmm. or no. And then if they say no, like, absolutely not, then you can say, look, you know, if it is, you know, you can always change your mind and let me know if you're upset about something. I'd really like to know. I think our friendship can handle it. So, you know, I and I think saying like, I think our friendship can handle it makes the person sort of aspire to being a better person, mm -hmm. like more mature. Um, I don't care how old they are. They could be 60 and do this. Mm -hmm. um, and because there's some 12 year olds that are more mature than, you know, grownups. So I think saying like, you know, saying that and saying, I think our friendship can handle it. I want that kind of friendship. Um, and when you're ready, come talk to me and then leave, right? Because again, that whole thing of you, have, we can't expect the best of people in the moment that we confront them. Mm -hmm. We can sort of depend on the fact that we're going to get the worst, <laughs> mm -hmm. like the most defensive, the most protective, the most, you know, justifying all of that. So if you give people a little bit of a, of like, without excusing their behavior, saying like, all right, anybody in this situation is going to basically react, not their best. Let me give them the information, let them think about it and then go back. And that's really countercultural because we are like this, right? And of course, with social media or the way in which we interact with each other is this thing of like constant getting reactions from people. So really think about that, that when you tell people say, look, if you know, if you don't get the response that you want or they're not listening, you can say, I don't think this is going really well. So again, like I said, a few minutes ago, I want to take a pause. Let's talk about this when you had a chance to think about it. And, um, you know, if there are things that I've done that have really upset you, I want to know. And mm -hmm. then you have to be ready to hear that because you as equally can be defensive, protective, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So you've got to be ready to be like, wow, that is really hard. And thank you for telling me. That is so awesome. I love it. I mean, I can't believe it's been one hour. I mean, this conversation went by so quickly. And I know we discussed a lot. If you had to summarize, what is the highest impact thing that young people, teenager can do or maybe a parent can teach their young te teenager what's the highest impact thing that they can learn based on yeah. everything we talked about yeah I mean I think it's really important for young people to remember that they deserve to be treated with dignity with essential worth like nobody can take that away from you and that you have the right to demand it that you have the the right to be treated with dignity but you also have the responsibility to treat others with dignity this goes both mm -hmm. ways and so what that looks like in your day-to-day -day interactions means that you're really going to have to take ownership of being like really capable of handling difficult situations, which means you're going to make mistakes and it's going to be super messy. And, you know, no matter how, like I make mistakes and I think about this stuff all the time and there's always a way, but treating someone with dignity also means that if you make a mistake, that you've done something to exacerbate the problem, make the problem worse, that you go back and that you say like, I'm going to repair this. Like I can go back and repair it. And it's good. That's good for me. And it's good for the other person without assuming or not expecting them to say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for saying it or doing it is that you are coming into your own by saying, you know, by repairing, if you make a mistake and that's treating yourself with dignity. And it's also treating the other person with dignity. 
I love it. Thank you so much, Roslyn, for hopping You're on. So welcome. This has been a great time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Where can people find you? Oh, it's really hard. My website, rosalindweisman.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> that is really hard. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> but um, all right. Yeah. Thank you everybody for listening. And I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for having me.